I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Sarah Baitup. She is a head of therapy at Clerkenwell Health, and she is a cognitive behavioral therapist, lecturer, researcher, and senior healthcare leader. She has spent her whole career working in mental health. She founded the first primary care cognitive behavioral therapy service in the southwest of England. She went on to teach the clinicians of the future at King's College London and Exeter University before joining IESO Digital Health, where she helped scale the company from 10 therapists to 1,000. Sarah was instrumental in learning how to use technology to amplify the effect of psychological therapy, and her work has resulted in a number of awards and publications. Whilst at IESO, she studied 1,000 therapists in order to learn why some therapists are more effective than others. Her work took her to Compass Pathways, where she was head of therapy research and training before joining Glockenwell Health as head of therapy, and Oliva Health as chief clinical officer. I'm very pleased to introduce you to your talk, Why are some therapists better than others? Thank you. Um, when they told me that I had the 5.30 slot, I was thinking, oh, well, I'm going to have one or two people. So it's, it's really lovely to see so many faces. Do you know what? I've been privileged in my career to spend, well, the last 20 years studying therapist traits and behavior and how they relate to clinical outcomes. I did this first at Exeter University. I was doing a master's in education at the time, and I was studying why are some trainee therapies, therapists really amazing and others seem to be really struggling? And it was really fascinating to me. I took this research to King's College in London where I was helping to train psychiatrists and psychologists and psychotherapists. The same thing applied and it was really fascinating to me. I then joined IESO Digital Health and I was really, really lucky to study a thousand therapists working um, with several million NHS patients. The NHS is the UK healthcare system. Um, and I had verbatim transcripts of every single therapy session that they delivered alongside the clinical outcomes. So using PHQ-9 and GAD-7 and other, data, other validated measures. Um, and I, this was the, the topic of my research in my doctorate and so I was very, very lucky to have this data set because not many people get a data set like that. The findings from my research showed me that there were traits and qualities that definitely correlated with good clinical outcomes and also traits and qualities that definitely co correlated with very poor clinical outcomes. So I took this um, this knowledge and this experience to Compass Pathways, and I helped them design training programs um, for therapists that were delivering psychedelic-assisted therapy as part of Compass's research. And I was really lucky to be able to observe hundreds of psychedelic-assisted therapy sessions, and I was beginning to apply that research to what I was seeing. Then I took that... Um, understanding and that learning which starts to pile up over the years to Clark and Well Health and to you today. Now today I'm going to be talking to you about, first of all I want to give you a bit of a summary of the research. What do we know about therapist variables in terms of why some therapists are good and some therapists aren't? Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some observations um, that I've had. This is more subjective um, um, knowledge, but what I've seen in terms of variance in psychedelic-assisted therapy. Then we're going to talk about, well, what are the implications for science? Um, what are the implications for practice? And I'm going to suggest some calls to action. I'm going to give you a little warning some of you might find this a little bit controversial, and I do that on purpose. I'm not going to hold back on some of the things that I'm going to say, um, because I think some of these things are, are really, really important. Um, probably this is going to be a bit of a Marmite session, I reckon. So here we go. Okay, so what do we know about therapist variables? What do I mean by therapist variables? 
what I mean, the difference between therapists. Without a doubt, there is a difference um, between therapists. One of the first people to notice this um, was a chap called Ricks in the 1970s, and he coined the term the super, the super shrink, the therapist who is absolutely amazing, superstars, and without a doubt, they exist. And I've met lots of them, and I think I can pick one out now um, quite quickly in terms of what, what they look like and their kind of traits. So he did some case studies of therapists working with young, young people. Um, and he, it was, he was the first person to actually say there is something about this person over here who's getting really good results. But he didn't really tell us what it was. He just said it, it exists. One poll is another person who's done an awful lot of research in this area, um, understanding you know, why are some people really good um, and some people are not. And then we've got a whole um, raft of research on therapist effects. So um, Johns, Kellett, Saxon and Barkham. So Barkham is um, a really um, well-published author so if you want to read about therapist variables, um, look him up. And my own research shows that there is very, there's a huge variance in competence between therapists. Therapists make subjective um, judgments. Um, so this is well documented. So even though if you train a therapist really, really effectively, when you put them in front of a client or a patient, they suddenly make subjective judgments. And they don't always do what is best. And the really best therapists seem to have um, an intuition about what to do for the best. And it is always theoretically informed. That is very different to the intuition that sometimes we see in therapy manuals for psychedelic assisted therapy, where we sometimes encourage people to go with their gut. There's a big difference between the two. So the therapist who goes with their intuition, when you ask them what they're doing, they give you a sound, theoretically informed rationale. I am doing this for, with, for this reason. And the therapist who, who say, will just say, I don't know, my, my gut tells me to do this. There is a big difference between the two. Therapist drift, this is well-documented. The therapist drift is really, really important in psychedelic assisted therapy in research trials. We know that therapists drift all over the place. It's a bit like driving. We're taught to drive, to pass our test, and when we pass our test, we do all sorts of things that we shouldn't do. It's just human nature. And therapists drift all over the place for all sorts of reasons. And we know that when they do, often the outcome isn't very good. And also, it's not really great for science, and I'll come on to that later. So there is a very, very strong relationship with competence and adherence to whatever model of therapy the person is delivering and clinical outcome. This isn't an argument about one type of therapy being superior to another. The evidence tells us that if it's an evidence-based intervention, whether it's counseling for depression, CBT, ACT, schema therapy, whatever it is, psychodynamic therapy, that these things are equally, they're equivalent. What is different is the therapist that's delivering it. It's all down to the therapist. So the implications for this are huge. And the difference in, so the, the really, really important thing, and, and this is sometimes where I get quite hot under the, color, under the collar, is this supposed understanding that the, mo the most experienced therapists, the ones that have got doctorates, the ones that have got PhDs, they're the best. Absolutely wrong. Totally wrong. And, it's, and the, there are study after study after study, and I found exactly the same in my study. There are numerous studies that demonstrate it doesn't matter how many years experience you have, it doesn't matter whether you've got a doctorate or an ordinary degree or no degree at all. It doesn't matter whether you're male or female. Your culture doesn't matter either. Um, these things just don't matter. It's about the traits that you have as a therapist. These are the really important things. So it all, it, I got hot under the collar 
um, at Compass when the FDA said, you need therapists um, that have got PhDs and doctorates. Totally wrong. Absolutely not. Some of the best therapists that I've seen have been therapists that have just got ordinary degrees um, or, you know, and, and have nowhere near the amount of training that somebody who's done a doctorate has done. If you've got a doctorate, what you're really good at is academia and writing essays. Without a doubt, that's what you're being examined on. And one of the problems that we might have around the world, and I've worked with therapists all out around the world, and particularly in Europe, the UK and America, there's a problem with the way that we train therapists in the world. We train therapists to write essays. So arguably, in the UK, there is probably one of the most advanced training programs for therapists um, in, in the world. There's a national curriculum, um, and this, I'm referring to the IAP program in the UK. And also for, uh, for a clinical doctorate for a psychologist, I have a colleague of mine who's, who's very, very senior in a very well-known university, and she told me, I'm terrified of the headlines that will come in a big newspaper that says this person's name, I knew the training was rubbish. And she's training clinical psychologists. Why is it rubbish? It's because we train people to write an essay and we don't really know what they're doing with the people that they're working with. What we, what we ask um, trainees to do is to hand in um, a self, um, a self-chosen tape of their work three times. They choose them themselves, and this gets examined. The first one doesn't count. The second do, two, they count. But that's just a little tiny snapshot. We don't know the outcomes of what, whether that person got better. We don't have any feedback from that person. That is not the way that we would train a surgeon. Imagine you had a surgeon... It's not the way we train any other healthcare professional. And yet that's what we do with therapists. And I would argue that that is why there is such a significant variance between therapists, because the training programs that we have are not fit for standard. <laughs> it is, it is. So what are the implications for science? Well, I, I kind of already can see that you're kind of a few steps ahead of me. We're doing randomized control trials. They're important. They're the gold standard way of testing drugs, right? And what do you do in a randomized control trial? You control for the variables. Well, we are excellent at controlling for the drug variable because we know that we're giving somebody 25 milligrams of psilocybin or one milligram. And that's robustly controlled, isn't it? So that variable is nicely controlled. We try and control for the participant variable by having inclusion and exclusion criteria. Well, sometimes I see that shift off a little bit. That's not necessarily as good as it could be. The other variable, and I know there are lots of others that were mentioned, Joe mentioned lots of others, the music and the environment. There are these um, variables. But the other big variable, arguably, is the therapy that's being delivered and the therapist. So I've been privileged to be, be um, sub-PI and PI on, on trials and been involved in training therapists for trials. Um, and what, when I see the, the, uh, the manual and the training that goes into some of these trials for the therapist and the selection of the therapist, I actually think, gosh, this isn't science, is it? So the training could be as little as one day. They read the manual. The selection of those therapists you know, is often done on a CV. We're not paying enough attention to what the, thera what the quality of the therapist. And if you also think, I, I can see this, I'm getting a little bit of a Marmite reaction there. So I'm arguing that the way that we train psychedelic therapists isn't robust enough, that we don't select them to control for the, var for the variables. If you think about the randomized control trials for evidence-based psychological therapies, and you just pick one, and you look at the effort that they put in to select therapists that can deliver it, 
that, they, that there's a manual, they test whether they can deliver whatever the protocol is, test and test and test, and the therapist it's drilled into them, you will do A, B, and C, and nothing else. We don't do the same in randomized control trials for psychedelic therapy. And there is massive variance, subjective opinion. There is massive variance. I've seen huge, huge variance. One of the reasons I think there's variance beyond what I've already said is often the, the modality of therapy that we're choosing. So many, many trials use a non-directive model. We use a non-directive model because the people advising the, the research teams have often come from indigenous cultures where they've had a wealth of experience. So we take this non-directive model and we teach mental health professionals how to do it. The problem is mental health professionals the world over are not taught this in their training because it doesn't exist as a model. So what happens when we teach a really experienced mental health professional this model is they think, shit, I'm not quite sure what they're talking about. What does that mean? It's all this language, I don't understand what it means. Nobody tests whether they can deliver this model according to the, the protocol. They just, you're trained, you're experienced, off you go. And what happens is, is those mental health professionals default to what they know best. So what you see is a range of therapies ranging from CBT, psychodynamic, person-centered counseling, and a whole sort of mishmash. This is not science. And one of the things that we do know, we do have an evidence base for, is we have an evidence base for things like CBT and ACT and, and counseling. And we know that roughly 50% of people get better. So we've got a benchmark. My question is what would happen if we then apply, um, we, we use that model in a psychedelic assisted therapy trial rather than a non-directive model. We need more research in this area because the hypothesis would be is could you push that recovery rate up from 50% to 60, 70 or more? So that would mean, to, that to me makes more sense because it's more robust science. There is an evidence base for that psychological therapy. There is no evidence base for a non-directive approach. So we would, take a, we would take a therapy modality that already has an existing evidence base where people are already trained in that modality because it's part of training programs in universities. And then we would see whether or not um, the, the effect was amplified, whether we increased the recovery rate. Plus, we have a better chance of reducing variance. One of the things that often doesn't happen is that we don't monitor what's going on in trials in terms of we record it, but actually monitoring it and monitoring fidelity to that model. Is that therapist delivering that intervention with fidelity to the model or are they doing their own thing? Because actually when you see results of studies um, and you, you see um, a therapist is actually the super shrink, my question is, what is that therapist doing that these therapists are not doing? We're not asking those questions. Implications for practice um, are fairly obvious, aren't they? We need to build confidence in world health systems, confidence that this is robust science with robust, understandable therapies so that the NHS, for instance, will adopt it. The NHS has not heard of a non-directive model how do you train a workforce in a model that nobody's heard of and is not on the curriculum anywhere? It needs to be theoretically informed, widely understood, so that it can be taught and it can be assessed. In the training programs that I've built more recently, I've built assessment into those training programs so that we assess the therapist's ability to deliver the model that they've been taught. And if they can't deliver it, um, and it's in a, it's in a, a role play um, with actors that we, that we film. We have a fidelity rating. They can't deliver it. They don't go into the trial. Mm -hmm. They can go back and do the training. We, we're trying to control the variables there. So here's a call to action. Robust science. Let's do this. Let's up our game. Robust ethics. What do I mean by that? I don't mean the, the, the kind of ethics that we do before a trial, 
but actually the ethics of we're doing important work. This is, this we have the possibility of discovering a new treatment for people that are, at the moment are untreatable. The really poorly folk out there that are not getting better with standard drugs and standard psychotherapy. We've got an opportunity here. Let's up our game. Let's do this properly. And let's protect the people because we take vulnerable people, we make them more vulnerable, and in that vulnerable state, ethically, I would argue, we need to do the right thing by them. And this will increase confidence. A perfect final statement. Thank you very much for being uh, in time, on time. And uh, I've seen many hands raising. Well, both microphones are <laughs> equally far away. Maybe I start with mine. Yeah, perfect. Uh, thanks a lot for the talk, and I and I do share your views on on this call to action. However, I'm just a bit curious on how this would look like in practice. Um, and so, so you mentioned these uh, more directive-like approaches, for instance, using CBT-like, if I understand it correctly, CBT-like methods in psychedelic therapy. So, how, so my question, or whichever method you choose, but I'm yeah. just curious on how do you envision this in practice? How would this be different to the, so how would this look like in a dosing session? In your opinion. How would it look like in a, in a therapy session? Yeah. Yeah. So obviously there, there would be a, a, a therapy manual that would tell people what it looks like. But so whether we would be using a counseling approach, whether we'd be using CBT or ACT or another type of therapy, we would be applying the theoretical model um, within preparation. So there'd be some common factors here around making sure that people had enough psychoeducation to understand what's going to happen um, and the preparation session in the setting um, and you know, all the things that I think are common factors in psychedelic assisted therapy. What I think would be different to the non-directive model is there'd be a lot more structure. Um, so that, for instance, if you were using ACT, you'd be introducing the participant to all the change mechanisms so we'd be using values to really get them to understand values in, in preparation and arguably that perhaps would be a really important thing. So instead of talking about intentions, we talk about values. What's important to you as a human being? What do you want your life to stand for? And how are you doing those things right now? And we'd be using mindfulness and other change mechanisms to prepare somebody. And then in integration, we'd actually be starting to think about behavioral change and, and using the experience that somebody has had to actually think about well what does that you know what would that mean to you in terms of your values so it's it's it, you're just applying the model that's just one example with act so it's just, just providing more structure and I would hypothesize and it's just a hypothesis so it's not written down anywhere but if you start if you look at some of the existing data from um, psilocybin trials, what we see is psilocybin seems to be a fast-acting antidepressant that really helps people get better, and then they, then, it, then they don't maintain their gains. And I would argue that the reason why they don't maintain their gains is they've not learned anything that they can tangibly hold on to. It's a bit like the drug that's been prescribed, the new weight loss drug. So what we're seeing is fantastic results with weight loss. Take somebody off the drug and they put weight back on. And arguably, that's because they, don't, they haven't learned anything. They haven't learned the behavioral change. So that answers your question. It's a, it's, a, it's a long question. Second question, do you have to respond? And then the third one, three. Maybe the fourth depends uh, on the outcome. Thank you for a very thought-provoking talk. So two quick things. First, can you say more about the outcome adherence relationship? My understanding was that meta-analyses show that it can be quite weak. And very quickly, I'm a fan of Wampold's work, but they, um, the dodo bird verdict, the idea that different psychotherapies, it's hard to actually show that they outcompete one another. That might suggest that there's actually quite a 
big range of ways you could... Yeah, it's really, really interesting. So um, my research showed that, um, and it's, 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 kind of, it's kind of hard to explain in a, in a few minutes, but my research showed that there were some therapists who were below average. So you can, you can think about average therapists, above average and below average, if you like. And a lot of these studies look at that. The therapists who were below average actually rigidly adhered to CBT, for example. Absolutely textbook rigidly. But what they were doing is exactly the same with everybody that they saw. Almost, almost exactly the same. So they just had their, let's say, John Smith model of CBT according to this textbook, and they did it exactly the same. The best therapists were still adhering to the model but they actually moderated and mediated the model according to the person that they had in front of them so that they knew that actually talking about a thought record with this person is pointless because they've, they've done hundreds of those before and it doesn't work. I'm going to take a more behavioral approach. And when you ask them, why are you doing that? They would say, oh, it's because, of, it's because they, they thought you know, they can't work cognitively or they're too poorly to work cognitively. I need to focus on this first. That is a key difference. So these therapists are scientist practitioners. And the therapists who, who are below average are not, they don't have those traits. So would you please help us move the microphone to the back? Uh, the person with a waving hand, thank you. And then given the, given the fact that this is the final talk, maybe we have some more questions. I see more hands raising. I just want to make sure that people that desperately want to get out for some reason, yeah, maybe what do they need? Is it working? Yeah, okay. To somehow play the story. Um, thank you for that no-nonsense talk. That was really cool. I also really like that metaphor about a Zen pick and the losing one's gains because they haven't actually learned anything. That makes that's an interesting interpretation of the current literature. Um, I was just a bit concerned though. So when you said that you want to put something more tangible like ACT therapy. Are you saying that we should literally, in the acute dosing session while someone's under the influence of very strong psilocybin, mm -hmm. that we do it then or no. rather as part of the preparatory and integration yeah. settings? No, sessions? I'm, I'm not saying that at all. So okay. I'm just saying, as I was explaining to this gentleman, in preparation, you, you, you would see um, ACT being delivered um, and instead of, instead of talking about intentions, we'd talk about values, and they'd be clearly articulated, um, and all the normal common stuff that we do in psychedelic-assisted therapy about talking about therapeutic touch, etc. What would I, what would, what would you want me to do if you were very distressed? All of those things are, you know, are, are, you know, are just exactly the same. The dosing session remains the same. I think if you were videoing it, you really wouldn't notice the difference. Um, and then integration, you'd see the difference again. All right, thank you. Yeah, is it okay for yeah, you? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I had two quick questions. Yeah. So the first was, I think you very compellingly showed that there's a lot of variance in these therapists. I'm thinking about this idea that then that has implications for our confidence in some of these findings. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm wondering if you think that there's any reason that findings that psychedelics um, predict better outcomes than placebo can in some way be an artifact of variance in therapist quality. Because I think otherwise you would just think it would just exaggerate variance in both of the conditions. But maybe there's some reason that you think this actually has implications for I, our... I think the short answer to that is I think there is more research with old data that we could do um, in terms of really digging deep and looking at what, you know, this, what we don't see in any of these published papers is anything about variants because nobody wants to publish that, do they? Why would you publish that? Because your, your, your paper's not going to get published to start with. So it's like, we trained the therapist to do this. End of story. Now let me tell you about the drug. But so you don't think it's like, oh, actually, the entire idea that psychedelics have these outcomes might be an artifact of, of therapist variants. I don't. I actually think my, pers my personal opinion is that, and I wouldn't be here if I didn't believe this, that psilocybin and other psychedelics are a treatment for the future. But my call to action is let's do robust science. 
Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, hi, um, thanks for the talk. Um, uh, is this now only about uh, psychedelic uh, therapy? Because uh, what about um, variables like compassion, uh, empathy, love, touch, uh, voice, yeah. um, trust building. You know, those, I, those in the literature, and I believe this too, are common factors in all therapeutic models, so that we know that these are, you know, these are essential. And some of the literature says that they might account for up to 50% um, of outcomes. So what you heard me say earlier, I don't think it matters which evidence-based model, which psych psycho psychological model you are using. I'm not here to say that one is superior to the other because I really don't believe that at all. I might have said this that 30 years ago, very naive, but I now know pretty confidently, and the data tells us this. There's no difference. It's about the therapist. So the therapist will have these common factors they will have the ability to build a therapeutic relationship and maintain it and bend and sway with the person that they have in front of them and, be, and work in a theoretically informed way. So without a doubt, these things are crucially important. Okay. And the final question. Ooh, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wow. Um, yeah, thanks very much for a really interesting talk. Um, I'm aching again to the first question that was raised in terms yes. of like the implementation, the practicality of it all, yeah. the practicalities of it all. Yes. When I hear standardization, what I hear right away, um, it's an imposition of a certain epistemology over others mm -hmm. because nothing exists outside of context. Yeah. Sure. So, I mean, I don't think it's far-fetched to say at all that, for example, Western medicine has served a lot better white people than black people yeah. in a country like the United yeah. States, yeah. 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 for example. Yes. And that's an understatement. Yeah, yeah. So, um, my question is, how do we implement this in a way, uh, like this standardized version of what everybody needs to do, yeah. in a way that actually really looks at a more diverse way yeah. of, like the epistemological challenges? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a very, very important question, and it goes back to the, my last answer. It isn't about delivering something in a, um, I'm doing A, B, and C, to you, 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 and you, and you're all different. It's about really moderating and mediating for the, the person's level of education, their vocabulary, their cultural background. All of these things are crucially important. So you know, that, all of that is within the training. So that means that we have to push the quality of the training up. And it also might mean that we need to employ other science. So the science that relates to matching a therapist to a participant or patient. Right now across the world, the way that we do that is based on whose diary is free. In a research trial is, I've got five therapists, which one of you can go next? Now that, what the research tells us about that is that that's a bit of a lottery. And that actually the variables, of the patient variables and the therapist variables, we can use those to match people so that we can give the person the therapist that is most likely to be effective for them. And culture, of course, is a really important part of that. And if I may ask just one final thing on that same note, just really yeah. quickly, sorry, Max, sorry, everybody. So then um, how do we also make sure that this way to like uh, implement some kind of standardization is not just a way to keep some people out of the game under meritocracy? Yeah, what kind of people do you mean? I mean, that's the way that the system works right now. Yeah. Just so many well, people are just completely barred from the possibility yeah, of becoming no, therapists. I, yes, yes. Now, there are, I'm sorry, this is going to be a, a bit of a, a longer answer to the question. Sorry. It goes back to what I was saying about the way that we train therapists across the world. So if we take um, the UK and America, because they, they do this a lot, it's all about climbing the ladder and move, moving up and moving up and getting a doctorate. And whoopee, aren't I an amazing person? Wrong. You're not. You think you are, but you're not. That's not to say no disrespect to you if you're a clinical psychologist. I know some amazing clinical psychologists, but I also know some really crap ones too. <laughs> so I think we need to change the way that we train psychological therapists. There's still a place for doctorates, but that's academia. That's science. It's something different. But actually, there are, there are traits in people 
um, in general, that some people will have these traits, they're innate. You can't, I don't believe you can train people to have these traits. You've either got them or you haven't. And there has been a study, and I think it was in India, and I can't remember the name of the author, where they actually started to look for these traits amongst the population in order to train them to help others. So this is a massive shift. Um, and I do think it's time to change the way that we train therapists, and that would solve for that problem, because we would be training the right people to do this important job. 